Electricity. Um, 
you reduced the number of mites on them. But the surviving mites were, we were selecting for the strongest <coughs> mites, in other words, and instead of killing, killing all of them or killing only um, the weak ones. I mean, I, we were killing the weak ones. Um, so we decided we needed to do some um, research about bees, and some bees survive anyway, and some bees uh, don't seem to need the treatments. They, they, they managed to live with the mites. And um, we went down to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where some researchers had found uh, bee queens in the eastern side of Russia that had been living side by side with an Asian honeybee, and this parasite, the varroa mite, um, had it, its original host was this Asian bee, and it jumped. It, it changed its host and started living on the European honeybees, which did not have behaviors to um, live with it. Um, the theory, I guess, of certain parasites is they don't want to kill their host. They want to live on it and reproduce uh, uh, continuously. But they were killing their, mite, the, their host when they changed to the other bees. But the Asian bees can live with the mites. The mite itself changed. It now has a different um, name. It's called Varroa destructor. Oh. <laughs> and, um, but these Russian bees, they were European honeybees that had been brought by colonists to the eastern side of Russia, uh, lived for several hundred years side by side with these other bees and these mites, and they developed behaviors. And part of the behavior was the ability to groom itself and remove the mites from their body. Um, and they would also swarm often or cut their brood pattern because the mite, go, the female mite goes into the brood, each cell of the brood when the queen lays eggs, and when the, uh, the pupa stage happens, um, the queen lays an egg, it becomes a larva, and then um, the pupa stage is when it's in this sealed cocoon. Well, when it's a sealed uh, pupa, it, that's when the, the mite let, reproduces inside the cell. And um, so when there's a lot of capped brood in the beehive, the population of the mite increases a lot because that's where they are, they're in the capped brood. So as soon as those bees emerge from their little cell, the population of the mite, of the, of the mite, the mite population explodes. And that's when it kills the hive. Um, so, so we, we, got some of these Russian bees when they were finally released. And the Russian bees were able to live with the mites, even though they had a lot of mites, it wasn't killing them. For some reason they would, they had certain little behaviors, including grooming themselves and uh, a few other things that they could manage to keep the mite population in check and still live with, with uh, through the winters. Um, they also had to live longer through a winter, so any of the surviving bees in the Siberia or wherever it was, had to live longer than a, um, the, Euro the European bees, <coughs> which had uh, a temperate. We, we have temp bees that were raised in Northern Europe, and um, anyway, I still have a few of my Russian bees, but mostly the Russians were too hard to keep in their hives because of their swarm impulse. They swarm too much, mm. and that breaks the brood pattern, and they don't... The, that, uh, that's how, that's one of the ways they can keep the mite population down, is by not having continuous capped brood in their hive. But uh, we started looking at other queens. Most of my queens here are now carniolans, which were made in Northern Europe. Uh, and also I have a few that are a, a man-made um, selection of behaviors <coughs> called v VSH, Varroa Sensitive Hygiene. And these queens, um, they can, I'm calling it the queen because of, she's the mother, but it's her daughters that have the behavior. Um, they can detect the mite in the capped brood and remove it before it can reproduce. Wow. <laughs> Which also reduces the number of bees being produced. Um, because if you remove a pupa that has the varroa mites on it, so the varroa mite can't um, reproduce, you're also reducing the number of bees. So we had to have a happy media behaviors that may produce enough fruit as well. And it seems to be working, if, if, at least partly. Um, we do have mites, and um, and we have to count mites and detect 
uh, how bad an infestation is at one time or another. Uh, but for the most part, we have a very good winter survival rate, and um, we take our we take our um, a wait. In the past, I've taken a waiting list for these people that want beekeepers that want our queens and our nukes. Last year, I had a uh, little nucleotide, and if you look at some of the shorter boxes, or see that five frame nuke over there, it's a narrower, and there's a few others. Um, they, I can divide the, a single deep box up into uh, two boxes or three with different entrances on each side of the box and have two or three queens in, a, in the same location. And that way I can raise queens, sell the queen before um, the population gets too big, or sell the nuke, which is the queen and four or five frames of her brood. Um, and so I probably sold at least 60, maybe even 70 nukes to people who were on my waiting list this past spring. And now, um, now we're getting ready for this coming winter and we will um, decide if we're going to do that again this year. How much uh, do you get for a nuke? A few of us have already mentioned getting older. <laughs> and uh, so we, we, um, we do have our, still our DSA breeder queen. And a lot of her daughters are out here heading other colonies. And uh, it's, a, it's been an exciting adventure trying to produce an actual better bee that can survive without um, heavy chemical treatments on them um, so that we are maybe not selecting for stronger mites, but selecting for a stronger bee. Mary, how much do you get for a nuke? Uh, 175, right? 175 for, yeah. Uh, we really should be getting 400, but beekeepers are uh, parsimonious. <laughs> <laughs> they won't pay $400. Mm -hmm. I, I notice each of your highs has uh, two or three bricks on top of the cover. How come? Because the, we get a wind, we get yeah. wind and storms through here, and I don't want the roofs of my hives torn off. Yeah. So it's just to keep the keep them down. Um, I have seen other people's beehives in the winter or whenever where it's open to the elements, and I'm thinking somebody didn't have a brick on that one. Yeah. Um, how can you um, keep track of the queen and then whoever she's produced? I actually have a database. And each hive has a number on the front of it. And so I know from the record, my total records of every hive, who the original mother was, when, how often she was superseded, her age now, because I mark each queen when they're born and I know the year she was emerged. How long do they live? Uh, I, the oldest queens I've ever actually had were four years old. Um, there have been known five-year-old queens, um, but four is an old queen. Um, if in the in the swarm season in April and early May, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to keep them in the hive. And they, in the spring, their job is to repopulate very quickly, and they build up after coming through the winter. So um, they put their queen on a diet, and she loses just enough weight to be able to fly again. Mm. And when she is stops laying eggs they start feeding other of her newly hatched larvae royal jelly and make new queens. And the old queen and a third of the hive or a big batch of her daughter queens take off and they hang in a tree somewhere and they start looking for another home. So that's the swarm time. Mm. If you've ever seen a ball of bees hanging in an inappropriate place somewhere, <laughs> uh, a beekeeper can, if it's, if it's not at the very top yeah. level of a tree, which they don't do it for our convenience. Um, we can rehive that swarm and then have her. And I have a few here that are swarms that we, we rehive that had ended up hanging in this tree, which is a little easier to get to. Um, and then if it's a marked queen, I know it came from my, my apiary, but if it's a daughter queen that had swarmed, I mark her then, and I know that she's uh, from that year. But I, I have a mark on all my older queens so I know her age. How do you mark her? Paint. Oh. A little paint mark. Really? Yeah. This, this one here is my, my father gave me this tree and it was a weed in Georgia. It's called a Vitex oh, or a chase yeah. tree. Vitex. And it, um, it's in bloom yeah. now and it yeah. loves all kinds of pollinators on it. So it's, it's one of my favorite trees too. And my father passed away. So this is his tree. Oh. <laughs> so, so. Somewhere. 
not 100% VSH, but it can be harvested. We're harvesting now, and when we go into the honey house, you'll see the evidence of that. Um, when you're raising queen bees, everything is to the hour. We know exactly from the age of that larva that we start with, and when it is due to emerge as a, an, a, a virgin queen, and then how long it takes her to get mated. And um, it, it, we just know exactly the timing of the development of queen bees. So we didn't want to have to keep track of that when we weren't home. So how do you get the bees there? You put, them, you put the hive in your car and drive them there? We move them in the evening after they're all in. They fly into the sun, so when the sun goes down, they're all, in theory, they're back in their hive. And we can close it up and then pick it up and put it on the, if we have a trailer or we have, if it's just one hive, we can put it in the back of our van and move it. What happens if any of the bees are left behind? Well, it, at night, they should all be in there. Yeah. Well, if there's a few that are that are not in, they'll make their way into one of the other hives. Oh. oh, yeah. They generally don't do that, so, but so they do go back in there okay. at night. Okay. Yeah, they don't fly in the night. So in the sunshine, they're moving into the sun, and that's when they're har they're bringing in nectar and pollen for food for the rest of the hive. The pollen is the food for the developing larva, and uh, the Nectar is dehydrated uh, by the, the, the inside bees, the nurse bees. They dehydrate the nectar and make it a um, thicker, they, they take out the extra moisture. When it's 15 to 18 percent moisture, they cap it with more beeswax and it's sealed honey. So they can eat that during the winter. But they make enough of it that we leave them enough for the winter and we take the excess. In January, we are out here to snow or whatever shooting. and just helping the hives to make sure they're weight, they have enough weight. We leave honey on them or we buy blocks of sugar from a friend who makes these uh, five pound blocks of solid sugar. And we put that on top because all the bees need in the winter time is a pure carbohydrate. And pure <coughs> cane sugar works fine just to keep them alive. There's, they're not feeding any brood in the winter time. They, they only have brood, the queen lays eggs, when there's a pollen source and flowers blooming. Um, so their only <coughs> job in the winter is to stay alive. And there has to be enough bees in the cluster and enough food stored for them to do that. They also have to be healthy enough, so we have to take care of the mites before that part, at that point, and make sure there's no other disease. So the last 22 years, our bees always had enough honey, honey to make it through the winter. We always make sure they have 50 pounds of honey in each, each hive. And the last two years, in October, they had enough food. And by January, all when we had 150 hives, two years ago in January, every hive, was not, they were completely out of food. And mm -hmm. the brood moves up into the honey source because the bottom part of the hive is where the queen is and her brood, and the honey stores surround that and go up. So as they're eating during the winter, they're moving up into that food, the, hu the honey so source. The problem is the early part of the winter is too warm. And they fly they more fly and, and eat they go more. out to do cleansing flights. When they come back, they eat their stored food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Normally, if it's cold, they're clustered and they don't oh. eat their food. Oh. Okay. So the last two years, last year we spent $1,000. The year before that, we spent maybe $700 on these sugar blocks. And we've been going out every four weeks. And, and we put I a think we put sugar, sugar blocks on three bees, times this past winter. winter. The bees alive, and, and they, they eat the whole thing. Wow. Wow. What they live. So, yeah. but, so that's um, what we've done now. Like this hive right here, which is facing north, um, we normally try to make the entrance to the beehive face south so they get the early morning sun. But if all of them are facing south, there'll be more drift. And we have a few of them that are facing north just to ha have a little different flight pattern. But this hive here, we harvested honey from recently, and the queen and her brood are in the bottom two. And for your question about the size, you can see the bottom box is a medium, and I have brood in that. And then there's the deep box, which is the yellow part of it. Uh, so the queen is in that. And then I have other medium boxes, because I'm going to use medium boxes for my brood. Um, the honey supers, the I won't have here. honey supers. Where are the raisin bees? Oh, the blue. The blue one right there is a shallower. See the blue? Mm -hmm. That's a honey yeah. super. This is a, a medium. medium. And this is a deep. So we decided 
the, the mediums are too heavy for us to carry. Uh, there's just too much weight when we're dealing with that much honey. So we only use the shallowest boxes for honey, for the excess honey, and we, um, we rearrange it. But if I have a shallow box that has brood in it, I give it to them and it becomes marked just for brood for them. Well, what Mary does is you ask what we do uh, in the spring. Every one, every single one of these uh, hives, Mary takes them completely apart. The queen is now the queen and brood has moved up to the top so, level so through the, the winter. The brood frames, move the brood frames around, uh, yeah. rematch everything. Well, we'll start at the bottom the again. Um, and they don't the upset when you open their home and. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we use smoke and we dress appropriately, oh, oh, okay. but uh, <laughs> um, but there and if a hive is particularly defensive, if I don't really like its attitude, <laughs> I um, we might requeen a hive like that. Uh, there may be some other excuse for it to be um, nasty tempered, because um, the coniolans have a tendency to be very gentle and tolerant of our of our messing with them. But uh, if they're queenless for whatever reason, like they swarmed and they don't have their new queen yet, uh, or um, something went wrong with the queen, they tend to be more defensive when they're queenless or if there's some other, like a mouse got into it in the winter. Mm. Um, we actually put in the winter a little mouse guard. We, we bend a piece of wire uh, or there's different things we can put in to reduce the entrance so a mouse can't get into it. But if a mouse did get into there, because when they're clustered, they aren't defensive and a mouse will go in there to keep warm, Oh. Um, and the mice are fo so destructive. They eat up, chew up the honeycomb and make a nest in there. Mm. And um, by the time the bees get active again, it's kind of interesting and disgusting mm -hmm. when I have found the skeleton of a mouse mm -hmm. inside it <laughs> because they just... We do have a lot of mice and all the stacks for the most part. About 90% of those keep stacks, we actually have a screen. a screen on top and bottom to prevent mice from coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they do like to come in the hives. When you the first couple of years we were here, we had skunks. Oh. We had a, we had a and put chicken wire in front of the hive. And skunks They scratch, scratch the, the front of the hive, and when the bees come out, they scoop them up and eat them. And oh. they are resistant to the sting. But the chicken wire on the front, the skunks don't like to walk on chicken wire. Oh. So, but we stopped doing that because well, we have We haven't seen any skunks lately. We do have. Um, which, which bird once in a while eats some of our bees? Um, um, the cat birds. Cat bird. The cat birds sit out there singly. They are not a bunch of them. Um, but I kind of like the call of the cat bird. It sounds like a baby in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think they eat bees. And we don't want to keep um, uh, wow. guinea hens would, would eat bees and a few other things. Mm. But um, we really don't have that many predators on our bees right now. That's a pretty good yard. In the spring. So this is winter when they're all... Yeah, clustered. So as they come up, the population starts building up really fast as the things start blooming early in the spring. And actually, February, the 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 wall, um, the maples start uh, blooming and they start bringing in pollen. So the queen starts brooding up early while we're still into the winter so that there is a population of bees. It takes 21 days for a worker bee to emerge. So she has to not that she's planning it, but the plan is that they will have their biggest population when the most things are blooming later in the spring. So they, um, and that's when they start swarming because that population builds up so quickly and they forget that they have enough space or the beekeeper didn't give them enough space. And if they have more brood than there is space in their hive, they will take off. And 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 uh, we, we try to capture them if we can, but. I just waved goodbye yeah. they, because sometimes they just aren't going to make it easy. Do you um, start feeding them sugar water in the spring? I, yes. If it, for nukes, yes. I have nucleus hives which um, are um, young queens and small populations uh, and they are always fed. Your, your, your mature hives, you don't have to? We don't usually have to. Uh, they have enough bees in them to um, to do that job themselves. When do they mature that much? One year, two uh, years? Two, the second year should be good, yeah. Uh, but but all the hives you see here, with a few exceptions, um, are older hives with mature queens and everything. Uh, but there's a few smaller ones, and they are the nukes that I had. Um, I either sold the original queen and requeened it, so these are, are going to go through <coughs> the winter as a smaller hive, and we might wrap them. Uh, we will make sure that they get fed periodically during the winter, 
You don't wrap your other hives? No. No, all these will not be. No, there's enough bees. Uh, there's a few other things. I wanted to show you this other method. Vegetable oil, just plain vegetable oil, but I do add a little 